Hi there. Welcome to this real life sculpting tutorial. What you can do in Blender, you can also do in real life. <laughs> Break it first. Break I'm it. breaking it. I just want to add, like, uh, when he doesn't expect it. One, you want two. Me to get a hammer? Oh, feedback? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, <laughs> So we are still on the threshold of production, which means uh, Hjalti, Rick and Pablo are, are still working on story. There are still some details to be worked on in previous and we still haven't tackled the whole beginning of the story, which needs kind of a rewrite. But in parallel, we've been preparing what will be needed for layout. So that means that Julian has been working on sets. It's not like we have one set per sequence, so I'm still hoping that things will catch up because we have to work on those big structures and that they need to connect and make sense with the cameras and the different angles that, that they're going to be seen in. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is how it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, horrifying. Yeah, this is horrifying. <laughs> uh, Vivian has been working on the color script. Simone is working on the shading and, and soon will work on the texturing so that it allows us to see the character in the boat in context, with lighting also, uh, some of the sea. Andy has been working on the, the lighting pipeline. This morning we actually created the first shot in Kitsu for the last sequence of the movie. Uh, we're doing things uh, right in order here. <laughs> it's a sequence that's very different from the rest, but still it's going to be Mikasa walking, and so we thought, you know, instead of just doing a walk cycle, better have Pablico animate Mikasa in the right file, on the right set, and that will also be used as a test shot for um, lighting and, and possibly everything else, um, compositing, etc. I don't even remember why, but I remember very clearly seeing a sailor uh, getting hit in the head by a boom and shattering. And then this concept of like falling in the water and filling with this sort of seawater, like how your mind gets full of what everybody tells you, you know, when you hit some kind of <laughs> problem in life. For me, it was a direct expression of my own experience, most recently with um, having been diagnosed with cancer in uh, the fall of 2019. And the process of going through not just the, the illness itself, which is traumatic and challenging. Like you kind of do what you need to do when you're in a crisis. And then it's after where it's like you really fall apart. I want to take this as a positive in some way. I want to allow this situation and the circumstance to create in me a transformation that's positive. Yeah, with Mikasa it was uh, very tricky because I just remember there was this certain point when Florent had this one sketch, I think we still have it here on the wall, and Jericho's like, yeah, this is the character. But still, that's just one sketch. From that point, we had to find different interpretations of how this character could look like in 3D. So that's that's when the whole iteration starts. She's a sailor. She's experienced at what she's doing, also because she's sailing alone. She is interacting with the ropes, the equipment. That is something that kind of always played into with her being depicted as strong. Originally, there were a lot more aspects to the character design, a lot of ideas that we played around with. But in the end, it's very difficult to get all of those into a movie that is very short. Stylistically, we were quite drawn to ceramics and this uh, amazing sculptor whose work we all adore, Beth Kavanagh. And then when we started thinking about expression and movement, we kind of got in this like, oh no, because if she's made of a material like that, then how does she move? <laughs> and how does she express? And so this also pushed the character around quite a lot until we decided to go with a more painterly style and relax on some of these, you know, these other considerations. And then the other big challenge for me is like, I'm not a character designer. And so trying to translate what I wanted to feel and see in a character to her stylization and specific clothing was, was challenging. And I really needed some support in that. Everyone had certain things that they brought to the table. It wasn't a single, yeah, this is the design kind of process. Until we had uh, Elisa come into the project. And I think that helped Jerrica because they could sit together and really talk about what the character would be on a you know, 2D design point of view. 
and she basically delivered a whole set of really great sketches. Based on those, she did the final design and then based on that final design, she worked together with Julian to come up with uh, what we have right now in the 3D model. So they want to do the previous of the scene where Mikasa puts herself together. And he told me that he wants to take a couple of planes and make the pieces that way. Planes. Animators. So um, what we're going to do is split up Mikasa using cell fracture really, really cheaply. Just one click of a button and then I'll ship the pieces over to him. And uh, that's much better than planes, I hope. I don't want name. to name. I don't want to do it easy. Hmm. This? This is not easy. I don't want to do it easy. I want to do it like the most complex, mm -hmm. okay. time-consuming way. Mm -hmm. That's how I do it. Yeah. Because I like to suffer. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually doing here is creating a cast of my arm and then move it when it's dry. This will create cracks. They give us some information on how the deformation of the skin is reacting to the cracks and where the cracks will occur. For the fracture attack where Mikasa's body shatters in the film, Simon came up with all the, the node setups, which mean, meant like the, the node setup for actually being able to draw, control the position of the cracks um, easily with like uh, just strokes. And also then we needed a node setup to control or I guess to, to represent the, the center point of each shard with a triangle so that we can then rig stuff to those triangles and it's quite hard to explain and a bit of a nightmare of a setup. So what we needed to do was to have something where we can deform the character like we usually do in general so the animators can just animate her as the full body but uh, visually the individual pieces should still be rigid and not stretch around so what we needed to uh, do for that was make a setup that we wouldn't have to do everything manually but just have a base that just deforms in a way that kind of makes sense for like rigid pieces in a way that the animators could actually just control the overall shape of the body but then the animators also need to be able to control the pieces in more detail on top of that so we can just toggle on the shards and then you can see there's a whole bunch of these uh, empties, or these, these controller bones. If I just move the regular rig that the animators control, the same for every other shot where she's not in shards. You can see how that is already fracturing everything, so the, the shards don't actually stretch around. They uh, follow the overall shape of the body, but each individual shard is a rigid thing. At the same time, you can also see that the bones in this separate rig are also moving around. So they're following the bone, uh, the shards as they're being deformed. And then you can just go in and move anything uh, you want. And uh, it's still following the, the overall shape of the animation. The point is Simon did all the nodes and then I had to do the scripting and uh, actually, you know, making them animatable. Fuck! So did you check the file? Yeah, I'm a moron. I put everything wrong. Fuck. Why did you ever... Why? Why? There's no suffering, there's no reward. Mm -hmm. you know? Okay. No, 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 no. New. Because we want to assign a new name. Call it uppercase geo dash. Geo dash. Dash, not an underscore. Ah, uh, dash. Sir. What I'm planning to do when it comes to rigging the boat, looking at the storyboard right now, it's it's going to be quite scary if, if we want to rig every single piece of the boat, because that could potentially be like 90% of that work could be unnecessary. So what I'd like to do is look through the final story to see which parts of the boat are actually in the film, which parts of the boat actually get interacted with and just focus on those parts. The history of how we came to it was we didn't want to place her like in a period. It's not a period piece. It's out of time. It's taken out of time. But that also means it can't be too modern because if it's super modern with like Kevlar sails and all this stuff, then it, then it starts to feel like something else. So we wanted to place it kind of in a vague, slightly timeless, some time ago feeling. 
Um, and one of the boats we were really drawn to and Phil found it. I'm not going to pronounce it because it's quite tricky, but... Uh, was a boat called Pen the Penduic. Ah, it's fine. It's, it's the Penduic? The Penduic? Penduic? Something like that. Basically, this is like the main boat we took a look at. We tracked down actually the daughter of the guy who originally designed it and built it out. So that was Eric Tapardé. And then we found his daughter as a professional sailor, and she was kind enough, gracious enough to consult with us. One of the first things she told us is a boat like that would never be on the kind of open sea that you're designing. So we were like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> and then she said, what you could base it on is sort of like a mix between that, that boat that we had and this, another one called the, the Cambria, which is a, a known racing boat. And so we kind of like pushed these two together and made it, you know, sort of the max size that a single sailor could, could take. Uh, out on the sea, and then we went from there. If you take a look at the sails configuration, you can really see it's like optimized for catching as much wind as possible. In terms of process, I took a, a lot of reference from miniatures. Very funnily enough, there is um, a website for boat builders, and these guys, they, they pour so much time and love into these uh, miniature models. One of the simplifications we did make was um, for instance, with the floorboards, very small detail, but the actual boat has very tiny, very slim and long, elongated wooden boards. And we don't have that. We have more simplified broad boards like uh, floorboards like this. One well, of the other aspects was adding small bevels and specific details to the wood. And that's like a small detail pass we did all around the boat to, you know, catch a bit more light here and there to add more strokes. So the boat will probably receive a sort of like combination between texture, shading, and uh, grease pencil strokes, as far as I know. In terms of modeling process itself, a lot of objects and data was reused in the form of instances. So it's in that sense also quite optimized. So it is sort of its own thing. Um, but you know, she looked at it, Marie looked at it, and she was like, yeah, yeah, okay, this feels doable, but also very pretty. Do you know how to s snap something, right? You're snapping. You've done snapping. Snapping like a... To, to like the, the ground or so. Do you think I need to snap it to the ground? Or do you think I'm gonna hmm? place everything by forcing my way and taking five hours? Hmm. What do you think? But I'll you know you can use snapping to snap something to an object, to a, a surface. Uh, yeah. I don't like select that. something. I select. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, you, uh, if you want to put it on the ground, just go to the snapping thing. To this one? Yes. And here, make sure this is on face. Yes, face. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Uh, face project. Align rotation to target. There you go. Of course I knew Done. all this. And then you... Uh, oh shit, this is going to save me like millions of hours. I'm sorry about that. Then it's, what is it, what I'm going to get from this? And I didn't learn anything. Well, I actually learned a lot. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the problem is like when I do it in the hard way and later I find the easiest way, I never forget it. Because, you know, I put my body to through a stress. Lessons from Pablo. Brute force everything. Mm -hmm. Hate yourself. Ask for help. And you will never forget it. I have a plus 10 year, plus ten year career following this. Mm -hmm. Moto, and look at me. Fantastic. I learn a lot. I learned to ask Andy before I do anything, because probably he knows something that I don't know. And it will make my life easier. So find your Andy in your life and ask. <laughs>